So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have Nicola Millert from BT. Hi Nicola. Hello there. So Nicola, for the benefit of our readers and listeners, can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about you and the work that you do? Well, yes. Uh, so my name's Nicola Millard. I am BT's customer experience futurologist. Um, Blimey. And I generally know what the first question is <laughs> on people's minds when I say that job title. Um, usually the two I get is, what on earth is a futurologist? And uh, the other one I get a lot is, do I have a crystal ball? Um, so the answer to the second question is, yes, I do. But it doesn't work. Right. Um, and the answer to the first question is, I'm kind of... <laughs> It's a bit of a misleading job title because I think most people expect futurologists to be, uh, you know, thinking 20, 25 years out, whereas my future is, is really anywhere between three three weeks and five years, I guess. So I keep saying I should be called maybe a nowologist or a soonologist. Um, right. Because a lot of the stuff that I do is, is relatively, uh, you know, um, soon, I guess. Um, the other thing is that most people expect futurologists to be technologists, and particularly I work for BT, which is obviously a technology company, mm -hmm. but in actual fact, my background is psychology, so a lot of the work that I do is really around how we are being changed by the technology around us, and, and that's both as customers, so how are we consuming differently, what difference does technology make to, to that kind of behavior, but also as employees as well, so I'm doing quite a lot on the, on how uh, technology is actually influencing the way that we uh, we work as well. Fantastic. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and also the, the thing that I write quite a lot on about on the blog, is that it seems to me that over the last handful of years or so, but particularly in the last couple of years, that people are starting to really laud customer service and customer experience and a, and a business's ability to deliver those things as being a leading competitive advantage. Mm. Do you agree with that? And why do you think that is? I do agree with it. And, and there are there are a few things. Well, firstly, I, I think that as customers, we will always regarded customer service as very important. I think uh, it's more important at the moment because as customers, typically, we have a lot more choice than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. And we also have a lot more transparency than we've ever had before. So the internet has given us access to absolute literally the touch of a Google button, yes. um, uh, information about every product and service we could dream of. It, it's taken down geographic boundaries. And we're starting to, uh, to um, I would say, we have to, if we have too much choice, we tend to seek advice. And that's yes. why search engines are so powerful in this area, because we used to ask advice from people we knew. Now we ask advice from a search engine. And, of course, search engines tend to throw up a whole load of uh, results, some of which are official, and we... As customers have become, we don't necessarily trust the official stuff anymore. So yes. we'll flip down and we'll, we'll take a look at some of the social content, for example. So what are other people saying about these products and services? Is this company any good? Have they been rated positively? And, and in that way, we're actually seeking advice. So actually, that, that's really weird because there's no customer service at all, really, in that. We've actually just done some research that we call the autonomous customer. Uh -huh. um, and the reason we called it that is actually a lot of these online customers are very, very savvy shoppers. And in actual fact, they're largely cutting the company that sells the products and service out until almost the last minute. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point, particularly on the sort of more risky purchases and maybe the higher value ones, it's at that point we really look at customer service and we, are, we start to throw complicated questions that are above and beyond the FAQs at these companies. And we kind of expect to, to access expertise and not just lovely people on the end of phones, because we do often pick the phone up for this kind of a, advice. Um, we expect, you know, people to know more than the FAQs to be product experts yeah. and of course if things go wrong we also expect to be able to to either lift the phone up or be able to contact somebody to to actually solve our problems get us to our goals so i think that, that that's that's been the game changer um, and the fact that we're we're often um, now very intolerant of bad service and we'll go elsewhere and we're not loyal anymore either so 50 percent of, uh, of customers in the uk are now saying don't take loyalty for granted but 
the counter fact on that one because we often discuss whether loyalty is dead. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it is. Yes. Because we're getting a very large percentage. It's in the 70, I think it's 76 percent. Um, I'm terrible at remembering facts, but it's in the 70 somewhere of customers saying that actually I'll come back if you make it easy for me. Yes. And that's a component of service as well. Um, yes. So you just make it easy for me to buy from you, to consume from you, to get service from you. And actually, the likelihood is I will come back to you. In all that, there seems to be a also a bit of a an interest and a movement and possibly a almost like too much of a focus on the, inter- the impact of the internet and social media and this burgeoning new area called social customer service. Mm. But yet you've, you've, you've talked about, sometimes I just want to pick up the phone and talk to you. Yeah. Now, are we being getting to a point where we're being led by technology about what's po- what possibly could happen and new developments in technology and may actually be in danger of forgetting the basics? Oh, absolutely. And, and again, the autonomous customer research that we've done, which was both in the US and the UK, um, a sample of a, a thousand customers, it puts the phone as the number one way of contacting organizations because it's convenient, it's easy. And also, because typically we're trying to do more ourselves, by the time we want to actually contact the organization, the likelihood is we have more complexity. Yes. We may be you know, angry, frustrated, all of those things. And, and that kind of pushes us towards we want to talk to somebody that can sort my problem out. And actually the phone, it's not new, it's not sexy, but it does, it generally does work. Now, the interesting thing with the, the research on other channels um, that we use, well, firstly, we are omni-channel customers now, not just multi-channel. Um, yep. We leap around channels because we're goal-directed, and if the phone fails us, we'll leap to another channel, and probably you know, email is, a, is another one. Web chat is a really interesting one. That's, that's if, if my money was on any channel growing in the next, a few years, it would be web chat hmm. um, because that's a kind of nice, it's a bridging channel. I keep saying if you're online, it's sometimes easier to press a button and go into a web chat session and hopefully get the answers from, from somebody uh, who, who knows what they're doing at the other end. Um, if you're on social media, this is all in public. This yes. The one thing I keep saying about social media, it's all in public. Yes. And in actual fact, if you want to, to and it's all only, certainly if you're on Twitter, it's only 140 characters as well, so you can't go into any depth. Mm-hmm. And you don't really want to put your personal details on there. So uh, web chat is a lovely bridging mechanism from, from the public element of social into a much more private conversation. So web chat, I think, is actually the one to watch. Social is an interesting one because our research is showing that social typically for most customers tends to be a secondary channel yes. rather than a primary channel. So maybe we've tried to phone, we've tried to email, um, we've gone in store, we haven't got what we needed, we haven't got to our goal, we've got frustrated and that's the point at which we go and rant on, on a social site, whether it be Twitter, whether it be forums are really, um, again, not new or sexy, but forums being very niche. Yes. They're often where a lot of customers do go to rant and, and rave and recommend indeed because they, those are the functions we tend to find with social media. So I think in terms of the, the newer channels, that they're, they're being added to the mix. They mm-hmm. all have slightly different functions. Yes. Um, but still, when we ask people, how do you want to contact organizations, it's still very much a phone business. Well, I think that's it's it's fascinating, and, and you know what? It's it makes me feel good about my overall humanity. <laughs> I'm very glad about that. <laughs> o- o- only because the, you know I have this the, you know this belief that you know, and it's it's just a statement of the obvious is that business is delivered by people for people. Yeah, yeah. And it, it doesn't matter what's in the middle. A person delivers something to a person, and actually, when we have a problem, that is yeah, invariably the 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 best and most satisfying, and also the most sort of emotionally tangible thing mm. is actually either seeing somebody or talking to somebody on the phone. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that does make a huge amount of difference, and you can see. You know, if you just look at if people have had a problem and then they've had a good experience and the, the customer service person, whether it be face-to-face or whether it be on the phone, if they've solved that problem, you do tend to get a, a, a hike in satisfaction. Absolutely. And, and that's where the value and quality lies. And I think that, that because that's perceived as a cost, to a lot of organisations, obviously in hard times, it's very, very tempting to just cut that cost and cut the service level. Sure. And I think that... Of, what we found is, we call it the demand delta, that's probably the wrong thing to cut. Uh-huh. The thing to cut is, is the waste, yes. um, the unnecessary calls, 
things that are confusing customers, things that are, that are making it, it difficult for customers to do business with you. That's where you need to remove the cost from rather than necessarily that customer service piece, which is so critical. Yeah, I mean, uh, going back to the, the um, making it easy for you, I know that you wrote a piece on your blog a little while ago about a mm. uh, Harvard article that was about the customer effort score. Yes, that's right. And it's about 75% of all customers will, was it, come back to you if you just make it easy for them? Yeah, I mean, that, the Harvard Business uh, Review um, article was, was it's back in 2010. That was, it kind of chucked the cat amongst the pigeons, I guess, in terms of previous to that, we were going, well, let's delight customers all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's focus on customer satisfaction. And that Harvard article, is, it, it was a very good study, a very big study, that basically said you don't necessarily need to satisfy customers. You sometimes just need to make it easy for them. Now, the work that we just recently published, uh-huh. actually with Henley Business School, Mm-hmm. was um, because a lot of people have been talking about things like effort for yes. a long time, but very we haven't seen a lot of action, lots of talk, very little action. Um, we actually asked uh, Professor Maura Clark at Henley to, to take a look at who was doing this. Right. And what did they find? And did they find that the Harvard Business Review article was actually correct in, in its assumptions and its hypotheses? And actually what we found was looking at, um, we, we firstly didn't find that many companies that were doing efforts. Right. One of them was BT, oddly. So I, I knew we had one case study. So uh, our, our retail arm has been focusing very much on, on uh, we call it uh, Net Easy Score, which is very similar to Net Promoter, but it's uh-huh. very much asking customers, how easy did you find it to do business with us? Mm-hmm. But but we found some other case studies, both within the, the, the B2C and B2B arenas, and Moira took a look at that. And actually, what she found was really interesting, to be honest, but, and, and pretty much backed up what Harvard had said. Mm-hmm. But Moira made a, a slight amendment, I guess, to, to the Harvard Business Review article, which, which had a, initially said, don't worry about satisfying your customers, just make it easy. Moira's finding was, Satisfy your customers where they value it, right? But otherwise, just make it easy for them. So there's a subtle distinction around that value piece. Yes. Um, but um, I think in terms of effort, it's really interesting to start to think of customer experience from an effort perspective. So how easy are you to do business, rather than necessarily looking at the wow factor? Because often people um, try to run before they can walk on customer experience. Sometimes, and you're right. Earlier, you said about getting the basics right. That's a fundamental thing. Get the basics right, otherwise you're never going to get that, that wow factor. Um, so a lot of that research has, has really um, sort of underlined the value of effort, I guess, in customer experience. I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, it, and it, it sort of mirrors my understanding and, and also some uh, understanding from other people that I've spoken to. I mean, I remember speaking to Mark Mullins of First Direct. Mm-hmm. And he said something which was uh, quoted something. Well, a quote from him that's always that stuck with me since uh, I did the interview with him. And he said, "We must understand the limits of interest of our customers." Yeah. And I thought that's brilliant, because actually, what it means is take a look at yourself in the mirror, and actually, and then take a look at yourself in the mirror from the perspective of your customer, and realize what's the right thing to do, what's the right sort of approach. Yeah. as it were, and don't try and sex things up when it's not appropriate, as it were. Yeah, and again, that sort of value proposition as well, that it's, it's around don't spend money on things that your customers don't value. Yes. Um, and, and again, I think there is a temptation to, to, to be carried away by that wow factor, and actually that's not what your customers are looking for. So I first direct do that kind of thing incredibly well. Yes. I mean, going back to something you talked about earlier on about um, the web chat, it's interesting because I have a client that does use web chat and the interesting experience, I can see the value proposition or the, the, the use, the value for a customer as it were, particularly because you can do it almost, you don't have to be on email, you can just do it via the web, it's not public you don't actually have to pick up the phone and so you can actually be interacting with somebody Mm. and getting your information without actually, well, you can do it surreptitiously as well if you really want to. Yeah, sit on the train with your iPad. You can have a web chat, whereas over the phone that could be a little bit, particularly if you're talking about your bank details. Yeah. You don't want to do that on the phone in a standard train, but you could certainly chat about it on an iPad. So, yeah, I mean that's that's another reason why we think it's going to grow. And the, but the other thing that, that on the flip side of that, from a business's perspective, 
what I've found, what I've heard as well, is that many businesses, it's what they're finding it quite hard to deal with is how it's, it's almost like sucking all the juice out of the sales process, mm-hmm. because you end up, um, they they they're getting to the point where they're saying, well, these customers are all asking all these all these all these questions and all these questions all these questions, and it's like sometimes we get leads out of it and sometimes we we don't. Sometimes people are just kicking tires in an interactive way, and it can be a real time suck, as it were. Yeah. And that's almost like there's almost like a new skill developing in the. How do I deal and please and also entice customers while using web chat? Mm, yeah. Uh, oh, yes, I, I think um, I mean, web chat can be used. A, a lot of this around sales process is appropriateness and understanding yes. a little bit more context about your customer and personalization. Actually, the, the, the one that I, I find absolutely fascinating, not necessarily related to web chat, but, um, but is in the retail space, it's looking at showrooming. Um, ah yes, and indeed. That's a, that's a classic example of, of omni-channel customer behaviour and action. In that we're, we're using the physical retail space in one way. We're then online. We're using the virtual space to compare prices, to compare products, to look at opinions, and then we, we go back into the physical space and then potentially challenge the uh, the sales advisors. Um, yes. You know, so you know, I can get this down the road for half price. What are you going to do about it? Or if you ask them a question and they don't know the answer, or they contradict something. That it's on their own website, they notice. So I, I think that that's a prime example of, of behaviour that we're seeing on a day-to-day basis um, that is really challenging that, that, that conventional way of managing a, a store. And I think the, the savvy stores now, they have the advantage of a physical space. That's an advantage, not a disadvantage. Sure. It's how do you actually then enable the salespeople mm. um, to do a good sales job and get that customer to buy in that store or, or from their website, frankly. I, I don't see why they, they need to compete their own website with their own physical store space. Sure. But as long as they buy from them you know, and, and get the right advice and get that salesperson you know, really linked in as an expert in front of that customer, or if they're not the expert, get them to be able to link in somebody else, maybe in the contact center in the back end or from another store, using something like an iPad. And I keep saying you can even use video in this space. Yes. If you've got you've got a camera on the iPad, you can start to video potentially someone from, you know, the, the customers in the store in Manchester, the experts in a store in Bristol. Why not just network them together? Sure. Um, and, and that's where the value, again, it's that value add. It's the people buying from people. Um, so I, I think that, that showrooming, showrooming especially absolutely fascinates me because it is a very, very good example of this multi-channel behavior that's disrupting. Um, the, the, the typical way of doing business. I think that's. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's the, there's there's some key, or some big challenges for businesses that that have to respond to this omni-channel sort of world uh, world, and the also the the changing behaviour of 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 customers and the demands that they make on them. I mean that that's. I mean, many businesses are finding that hard. Yeah. Yes. Oh, completely. And I, I think I always say that businesses are built to last, not to change. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to, to, to be stuck in silos. And to be perfectly honest, with multi-channel, omni-channel, channel, probably the biggest problem is the fact that maybe the physical branch or retail space is run by one department, the website's run by another, the contact centre is run by another. Yeah. Um, and it's very easy for those to become disconnected. Um, so from a business perspective it's a challenge it's a real big challenge that 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 takes down front office backup office it takes down silos and that in itself is quite difficult to do i, I think it also probably kind of takes it also probably puts a demand on on upskilling as well and we may actually put a, a demand on on sort of the sort of people that you hire and the wages that you may have to pay to attract those people completely and we talk about so i often get asked about the future of the contact center for example um, and that, that's one, one environment that's changing fundamentally because autonomous customers are showing that, uh, that almost one in two of us, by the time we get to ring the contact centre, have complex inquiries. And contact centres were never built no. to do that. They're often, as you said, you know, they're, they're, they're often the least qualified people in the company. They're often reading from a script. Yes. They're often the lowest paid people in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're getting these challenging uh, customers who think they know more than they do, which they might do, yes. uh, 
often are online simultaneously, will have done their homework, mm-hmm. don't want the script. Mm-hmm. They want the expertise. So the, the, the future of the contact centre from our perspective is much more around how do you network the right expertise with the customer sure. rather than simply have somebody who is lovely um, but can't help. I mean, yes, I think that's completely right. I mean, and it reminds me of, a, again, another conversation I had with a, a chap called Vala Afshar of Enterasis Networks. I don't know if you know them. No. But what they've done is they, they don't have, they've done as a, they're a technology company, they provide a lot of the boxes, as it were. Mm-hmm. And they don't they don't actually have a a, a contact sector, sector or, or contact center as such where they put all their engineers yeah. up on the front line yeah. because that's and that's just the way that they run their business and that's their culture as it were because they know that they give so much information that when people come and and speak to them actually they want the right the right people speaking to to their customers yeah. and they know that it's it goes back to that effort side of things they know that the if I, as a customer, speak to somebody and they, they say, I need to put you on hold because I need to go and find such and such person or connect you with such and such a person, that just increases the effort, as it were, and the wait time and everything else. And they've just thought, well, why didn't we just collapse that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a very good example of, of the network expert model. It's around who's got the expertise to answer the questions. And if the answer is the engineers, why not mm-hmm. look at how you network those engineers in appropriately and build that into their workload? But I mean, I, I work I work across all sectors um, in, in my job, and, and each sector has its own challenge. So banking, for example, you can't give financial advice unless you're qualified to do so. Well, um, yes. But you know, instantly that that level of expertise. So for a mortgage advisor, you've got to go through that, an awful lot of exams to become a mortgage advisor. So there aren't huge amounts of them. So sure. if you walk into a bank branch and want mortgage advice, and you don't have the mortgage advisor on site. How do you network the customer with the mortgage advisor that is available? And so, you know, it, it's a real dynamic that breaks down that front office, back office. I, I, keep, I keep saying I did a blog a while back that got censored that was originally called Is Your Back End and Now Your Front End? Um, right. Because it's very much around, um, often the complexity is such that it, it falls within what we might term a back end function sure. rather than necessarily being stove piped through a, a, a sort of standardised um, vanilla contact centre. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think of in you know in your in your your job and your your role and things? What what have you found are some of the big lessons that people that you're working with are that that you're learning for businesses in this sort of new world and this ever faster changing world, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a really difficult question to answer because I think there are so many things that that's you can That's my forget. job. Um, absolutely. But um, I, I, I always say, you know, your, your first thing, the first challenge for any organisation is to really start to understand the customer. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are so many facets to that, ranging from, obviously, there's a lot of discussion around things like big data at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I keep saying, well, there's been, big data's been around for a while. It's just that actually the difference now is we have analytics tools that can very effectively make sense of big data, but um, we do have to learn from the uh, from the sort of old days of CRM that just learning about the data isn't enough. You need to learn and then do something about it. And sure. again, because organisations are built to last rather than to change, that can be quite a difficult challenge. So to, yeah. from from the, from the understanding the customer demand and understanding your customers um, you then need to sort of build your your, um, your contact strategy from the customer in rather than you out yes um, and obviously there are many 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 channels many doors that you can open um, and and the question then is what doors do I want to open and how do I op- how do I open the appropriate doors and then how do I manage each of those doors so that there's a consistent corridor connecting them all well I think so and I think what well, I'm I'm also seeing I'm also seeing, which is quite interesting, is is companies that are starting to, rather than, if you think about it from a traditional, we're ready for you to contact us, as it were, mm. they're actually getting to the point where, particularly if you think about call centers and listening centers and all of those things, that it's it's quite passive and reactive, yeah. rather than proactive. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting, and let me I'd be interested in, on your your thoughts on this is rather than 
customer service and customer experience being an inbound type of thing, mm. that it changes and actually becomes more of an outbound or a hybrid of the two. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, there's, there's some of the opportunities with big data, and I keep saying that customers are generally not necessarily just going to give you their data, mm -hmm. unless there's something in it for them. Mm -hmm. And that's where things like proactivity come in, um, because if I give you my data and you start to understand a bit more about me, you can start to be, become a lot more proactive. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. And also, I mean, things like social media, you can do a lot proactively with social media. We, we do in BT, we, we'll be uh, uh, actively looking for, for people that are venting on social media about aspects of, you know, maybe their broadband slow or their vision box is broken and they're, sure. they're off for a rant. And um, we'll, we'll pick those guys up um, mm -hmm. using actually some innovation uh, developed uh, by ourselves. Um, but it will go straight into the contact centers to the right expert, and then they will effectively be proactive with the customer and say, I'm really sorry you're having a problem. If you want some help, we can help you. And mm -hmm. then we'll bridge them from that public channel into the private channel because we need to find out who those customers are. But it's the customer's choice then whether they, they respond. Yes, um, oh, indeed. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think that that, that often that proactivity is, is appreciated because if people have got to that point where they're ranting, um, they're obviously not very happy with us. And if we can help, um, you know, we're very willing to help them uh, to try and overcome their problem. But the ball is in their court once we're, we're, we've picked it up. It's then up to them to contact us. So lots of, um, as you say, built to last, not to change. So lots of big change challenges coming up for many, many, many firms in this changing environment that we that you know, we find ourselves in, but it's in the interest of time. Is there anything else that you think that you are seeing on the horizon that you think that businesses should be starting to pay attention to when it comes to, if you like, building better relationships with their customers, or engaging with their customers a bit better? Oh, well, there's so many things, but I, I think the one that scares me the most is the effect of smartphones on customer behavior and, and also the, the, the fact that these devices are so sophisticated um, that, they, you know, that there's the whole, I think they call it Sulu Mu aspect of them. So it's social, it's local, and it's mobile. It's turning the internet local for a start because sure. it knows where you are. So there's lots of potential for personalization. There's lots of potential that, okay, if... Uh, you know where I am, what are you going to do for me? What's in it for me? Can you sure. maybe cut out the lovely thing like queuing? You know, do you want to queue? No, not really. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a whole load around things like mobile payments, so these things are becoming a wallet. Mm -hmm. So I know at the moment in the Apple store, this is here already, you can scan a barcode and pay without going anywhere near a till, and the receipt is mailed to you, and you walk out effectively without going anywhere to pay mm -hmm. so you know that those things are transforming the way that, that we're doing stuff so i actually think that 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 whole the smartphone space is is absolutely fascinating to me and, and the sophistication of those devices are very very much changing the behaviors particularly the under 34s yeah you said the under 55s are largely largely using their smartphones as phones but the under 34s are, are, are sort of tapping into this huge richness that apps give them that location-based services give them and that social gives them and, and i think that that's a that's, that's a huge challenge yeah um, but it's a huge opportunity for companies to, to start to build very different relationships with their customers I mean, just on that before we sort of uh, wrap up, is do you think that there's possibly an emergence? It's almost like a generational sort of split happening yeah. within our customer base. So you have the customers that are maybe broadly 55 plus that might be using their their phones, whether smart or not, just as phones. Yeah. And then there's the the younger generation that are they're all networked up and they're quite happy to have their phone as a wallet and everything else. And so it almost as if you've got two different groups that sit at the opposite end of the, the you know the spectrum and have sort of really different demands i mean that's if you're and if you're operating across the whole spectrum as say you are as bt mm. that's that's hugely challenging oh absolutely and, and there are <laughs> some generational set it's stereotyping hugely but of course you know that of course uh, the silver surface the over 70s are actually starting to embrace these wonderful technologies that are so much more uh um, things like the iPad and, 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 and is a very big adop adoption because they're simple. You know, you don't yep. need to turn it on. It's 
it's not a PC, you don't need to know how to use a mouse. Um, the app does what it says, you know, so, so although, you know, we have got a huge adoption there, it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily think, oh, I have a problem, let's go onto the app and sort it out. Actually, that generation, is, we're all products of our own of our own upbringing. They're very familiar with the phone. Uh, they're very familiar with face-to-face. -face. They're still demanding those, those channels as primary problem-solving channels because the newer channels they don't even necessarily think of sure. as, as customer service mechanisms, whereas the under-34s have grown up with that technology. Um, the email, for example, is so last year mm -hmm. um, to, to a lot of teenagers, certainly. And they wouldn't consider using email as a, as a communication channel. And um, they're much more likely to use something like web chat or social media. Sure. Um, so, yeah, there, there, is a, there is a generational challenge there as well. Okay. So, Nicola, the, I always end these interviews with one final question. And mm -hmm. that question is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> well, I, I I would like to shamelessly plug BT Let's Talk blog. So uh, all, all of the stuff I do tends to get blogged out on there. So that includes things like we have a lot of white papers. We do an awful lot of research. So things like the customer effort paper and the autonomous customer uh, results are all out on there. Plus a lot of my other fellow um, uh, innovators and thought leaders uh, put stuff out on there on a, on a daily basis. So, so go visit the Let's Talk blog and uh, and you can see the kind of thing that BT's doing. That's fantastic. So I'll make sure I get all that linked up and and give it a big sort of shout out when it goes live. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. No problem.